Welcome to the Bible class of Jews for Jesus with Bob Mendelson. This is Judges chapter 9. Abimelech, the son of Jerubbaal, who was Jerubbaal? That's Gideon. Went to Shechem to his mother's relatives, spoke to them and the whole clan of the household of his mother's father, saying, Speak now in the hearing of all the leaders of Shechem, which is better for you that 70 men, all the sons of Jerubbaal, rule over you, or that one man rule over you? Also, remember, I'm your bone and your flesh. I mean, if this guy's not a politician, I don't know what is. He probably handed out his card, probably had a flyer with his name on it. Abimelech for king. And his mother's relatives spoke all these words on his behalf in the hearing of all the leaders of Shechem. So he first mobilizes his cabinet, and then they go and market him to all the leaders of the village. And they were inclined to follow Abimelech, for they said, well, he's our relative. Okay? They gave him 70 pieces of silver from the house of Baal Berith, with which Abimelech hired worthless and reckless fellows and they followed him. So he's got his mob, he's got his mafia, he's got his inside circles, you know. And he went to his father's house at Ophrah and killed his brothers, the sons of Jeroboam, 70 men on one stone. 70 men on one stone. That doesn't mean with a stone, like David and Goliath. What does that mean? It means on, on a, like a gallows, if you will, on a rock. Put your head down, slice, slice, slice. Jotham, the youngest son of Jeroboam, was left, for he hid himself. So 69 or 70 are dead, one still alive. One escapes serendipitously. All the men of Shechem and all Beth Milo assembled together, and they went and made Abimelech king by the oak of the pillar, which is in Shechem. So was that a, a good day for Abimelech? Was that a good day for his brothers? Was that a good day for the Jewish people? This well typifies what we've been studying in this book continually, that Israel, calm, wonderful, rest, fails and goes and sins. How did we sin just then? We sinned because he did. Uh, but look at chapter 8, just a, just a few verses back. Remember, the sons of Israel, verse 34, did not remember the Lord their God who delivered them, nor did they show kindness to Gideon's house in accord with all the good that had been done. So the last episode ended with this spiral down, and here Gideon's boy Abimelech, who was his son through the concubine, not through one of his wives, kills 70 of his brothers horrible. Now, to kill 70 guys, these are fellows. These are men of stature. He had to have henchmen holding them, or he drugged them, or he did something to maim them so that he could then finalize the killing at one stone. See how that works? You couldn't just say, Excuse, next, come up here, next, you know, get your stamp, get your stamp. I mean, whatever it was, it was um, a family side. You know, there's infanticide, there's homicide, there's suicide. This was an entire family side. He killed 70 brothers. That's a horrible day. It's a horrible image to keep. Now, what I've got here is an outline for tonight's lesson. You see that the kingdom is is uh, seized. That's really what he's doing. And I see that as the seizure of those fellows. I think he captured his brothers somehow using other men. I'm not sure what it was. <clears throat> I don't think he tricked them and said, come to the birthday party. You know. So um, he seizes the kingdom. You can hear the selfish ambition early on. You, should you really have 70 guys lead you? How about just one? Remember, what was Gideon offered in the last chapter? Be king. To be king. And he said, no, nah, you don't want that. You don't want that. But he overheard that conversation, didn't he? And he said, I could be king. I could die. Dominate. This is cool. I want that. Right? Um, he practiced. Look at verse 4. Um, they gave him 70 pieces of silver from this idolatrous house. Mm -hmm. And he used that money for evil. Flood money. Yeah. Verse 5, the murder. Uh, verse 6. Look at verse 6. All the men of Shechem assembled together. They went and made Abimelech king by the oath. This is a false swearing. That's what I call lying. Um, it's another commandment broken. The commandment to not bear false witness because they're bearing false witness that he was the king. Horrible, horrible day. And then pride is the next sin, if there are seven deadlies. Verse 7, now when they told Jotham, he was, he was the last one, the youngest son, the one that escaped, he went and stood on the top of Mount Gerizim and lifted his voice and called out. He said to them, listen, you idiots. 
<laughs> didn't say that. Listen, you guys who just made this loser king, listen, O men of Shechem, that God may listen to you once the trees went forth to anoint a king over them. And they said, reign over us. But the olive tree said, oh, shall I leave my fatness with which God and men are honored and go to wave over the trees? So he tells a story, basically, even the trees get it. Why don't you guys get it? So then the trees went to the fig tree. You come reign over us. But the fig tree, wiser than all the other trees, shall I leave my sweetness and my good fruit and go to wave over the trees? So he's using this story to remind them that we shouldn't have a king. We should not be like the other nations. The tree said to the vine, verse 12, you come reign over us. But the vine said, shall I leave my new wine, which cheers God and men and go to wave over the trees? Finally, all the trees said to the bramble, <laughs> You come reign over us. And the bramble said, If in truth you're anointing me as king over you, come and take refuge in my shade. It doesn't have shade. <laughs> but if not, may fire come out from the bramble and consume the cedars of Lebanon, which are the tallest known trees then of the time, right? So therefore, if you've dealt in truth and integrity in making Abimelech king, if you've dealt well with Jerubbaal and his house, and have dealt with him as he deserved, for my father fought for you and risked his life and delivered you from the hand of Midian. But you've risen against my father's house today. You guys blew it. You killed his sons, 70 men on one stone. Who's he blaming? Listen, who's, this is Jotham. Who's he talking to? The men of Shechem. He's telling the men of Shechem, you killed his sons. 70 men. So now that helps you understand who were the henchmen, who were the guards, who were bringing the 70 boys in. And when I say boys, over time Gideon had 70 sons. Some would be 60 years old, 50 years old. I'm thinking these are men of, of, of substance. So the, the Shechemites brought them in. You've made Abimelech the son of his maidservant, king over the men of Shechem because he's your relative. You guys don't get it at all. That's what he's saying. How dare you? You, therefore, are responsible for the murder. You guys did it. This is hard to be, because think about it. Jotham watched from afar, 70 boys, his brothers, die. He comes up to the murderers and said, you're murderers? What's the natural worry that's going to happen? Oh, Next, stand on the stone, buddy. <laughs> but what chutzpah he's got. Mm. What courage. Fantastic. Good for him. If you, verse 19, have dealt in truth, emet, and integrity, tamim, or completion, or perfection, with Jeroboam and his house this day, rejoice in Abimelech and let him also rejoice over you. But if you haven't, let fire come out from Abimelech, consume all you people, the men of Shechem and Beth Milo, and let fire come out from the men of Shechem and from Beth Milo and consume Abimelech. If you have done wrong, <laughs> there's going to be a battle between all of you. You're going down. What's he saying? You're going down. <laughs> That's what he's saying. Because you guys murdered, you guys broke every one of the Ten Commandments. Jotham escaped. Verse 21. I don't know how he did that. Because he's got the leaders of Shechem there. He's no doubt got other people around who are still full of vengeance. He escaped and fled and went to Be'er and remained there because of Abimelech, his brother. So he, he'd already been in hiding, right? The 70 were killed. He comes out of hiding. Hey, guys, he yells from Mount from the top of the mountain. And he and he tells them this story of the trees. We don't want a king, we don't want a king, we don't want a All right, says the bramble, we'll be king. This is guts, this is courage. I, I like him a lot, but that's all the story. That's the end. You think, oh no, what's gonna happen in the next episode, verse 21, sorry, verse 22, Abimelech ruled over Israel three years. And, oh man, mm. what a lousy prophecy. He prophesied that if you guys think you did right, okay, make Abimelech king, have a nice day. And for the next three years, it was have a nice day. But they had done wrong. They had done evil against God. So what did God do? He took a little bit of time. What lesson, come on, this is too easy. What lesson do you learn? That God answers just, he's a just God. He answers horrible misdeeds in his time, not your time. Yeah. And the Holocaust and so many things. I mean, people say, if there really were a God, why didn't he kill? Why did why did he let Hitler kill six million of our people? And you think, why did why did Stalin kill forty million Russians? Mm -hmm. You know, or however many. Mm -hmm. Stalin's responsible for their death, and Hitler and all those. 
Why didn't God stop all that? Well, he did within, within years, years. A world war should still be, well, maybe it is. It should still be going on because there's enough hostility and venom within people in Austria. And didn't they just elect a far-right madman who's got the exact same cred as Adolf Hitler? Are they that ignorant of history? A guy who commends Hitler's social policy? Yeah, there's all, it's all kinds of bubbles, like on I'm top of a bubble. porridge. It's only, it's only the atomic. Yeah, and I, when we were in Japan, um, Patty went to a section of Hiroshima with the historical thing, a museum, and heard the story from the Japan point of view, which was most interesting. Maybe she'll tell us one day. The horrors of war and the horrors of all the misdeeds done by Abimelech. You think, come on, God, deal with that. That's evil. That's bad. Stop it. And God does it in God's time. 1939, September 1st, Hitler invades Poland. And soon after that, millions of Jews are killed. You think, well, that shouldn't be. He should have stopped after one, after 12, after 47. How many Jews was enough for God to get the attention? How many Jews were burdened in the land of Egypt at the time before the Exodus? For 100 years. Years, 200 years, 300 years. Well, come on, God. If there really were a God, he would have answered our prayers by now. But it took God a long time because God's time is not your time. And I don't get it. I'm not going to defend God. God is well able to defend himself. He does what he does in his time. Psalm 31, my times are in your hands. Mm-hmm. Deliver me. That, that I don't understand God's timing. I just believe it. Now, is that an excuse? Is that kind of, uh, well, yeah, you say that because you don't have an answer. Uh, Right. I say that because I do not have a personal human answer, but my answer is God's timing is in God's hands. And only a person of faith gets that. Tomorrow, no shaving. Then, verse 23, after these three years of pain and desperation and worry and maybe Jotham's simple faith, I don't know. If the Bible's silent, I'm going to be. Then God sent an evil spirit between Abimelech and the men of Shechem. You think, come on, you could have confused them three years earlier, two years earlier. Uh, uh, six months ago. No, he did it when he wanted. And the men of Shechem dealt treacherously with Abimelech. Yeah, you can read that in Romans chapter 1, that God gave them over to X and you feel the pain that they rejected and so then God gave them over to Y and you feel the pain and then God gave them over to Z and there's this continual opportunity for the people to repent and return. You see that with Pharaoh when God hardens his heart and then Pharaoh hardens his own heart and then God hardens his heart. You see that retribution, that slow, steady progress into the despair and death that Pharaoh brought on his own household. I suppose we could use a biblical understanding to say that God was using that same modus operandi here. Let's just say that these sins in the early part of the chapter are enough to cause Abimelech to be judged. He's not living a faith-filled life, not living a a Gideon life. And dad would be so very disappointed. Boy, you don't want to be Abi Abimelech. Verse 24, so the violence done to the 70 sons of Jeroboam might come and their blood might be laid on Abimelech, their brother who killed them, and on the men of Shechem who strengthened his hands to kill his brothers. In other words, assisted. The men of Shechem set men in ambush against him on the tops of the mountains. They robbed all who might pass by them along the road. And it was told Abimelech, that's not good. There's some real fire between them. You see that? There's there's a dealing treacherously. There's a hostility. There's mistrust. Faith, sorry, what did we say? Fear is faith misplaced. And this same kind of mistreatment is a lack of faith or a faith against them. Yeah. Verse 26, we get introduced to a new guy, Gaal, the son of Ebed, came with his relatives. <laughs> his brothers, and crossed over into Shechem, and the men of Shechem put their trust in him, Batach, put their trust in him. That is allegiance, that is loyalty, that is what we've always wanted, that's always good for us. They went out into the field, gathered the grapes of their vineyards, trod them, held a festival. (laughs) It was a wine and cheese festival, just like we're used to in Manly and in the Shire. They went out into the house of their god, and ate and drank, and cursed Abimelech, and Gal said, who's Abimelech and who's Shechem that we should serve him? Is he not the son of Gideon and is Zebul not his lieutenant? Ha, serve the men of Hamor, the father of Shechem. Why should we serve him? They're drunk. They're drunk when they're singing this song, if you will. Would therefore that this people were under my authority, Gal says. 
then I would remove Abimelech. So what's he doing? He is running for office. Well, they have leaders. They're unnamed leaders, but the leaders of the of the Shechemites are earlier. Do you think anybody trusts anybody? Verse 30, when Zebul, the ruler of the city, heard the words of Gaal, the son of Ebed, his anger burned. And he sent messengers to Abimelech deceitfully. <laughs> And he said, hey, hey, you can almost hear the whisper, right? Hey, Gaal, the son of Ebed and his relatives have come to Shechem, and they are stirring up the city against you. Now, therefore, come on, get up at night, you and all the people who are with you, and lie in wait in the field. So they organize a military operation, and uh, I'm going to consult, and I'll be your advisor, I'll be your assistant, I'll be your um, adjutant, whatever you need. In the morning, as soon as the sun is up, you rise early and rush on the city. And when he and the people who are with him come out against you, you'll do to them whatever you can. So? Abimelech and all the people who were with him arose by night, lay in wait against Shechem in four companies. The, the military advisors there are amazing to me. This one says this, that one says that, and they say, yeah, let, yeah, that'll work, because they're not really strategists. The only strategy Abimelech ever had was to be political and gain superiority by promising whatever, but he doesn't know how to run a campaign. So Abimelech, all the people, rose at night, lay in wait, verse 34, in four companies. So he's trying to secure the kingdom, okay? He has already seized it, now he's trying to secure it. And that's what this whole military battle is about. Um, He's trying to make sure that he's got these guys on side and the right guy. You know, choosing your right, choosing allies also requires you to choose enemies. If you want to be wise, choose the right enemies. Choose the right people to oppose you. You're not going to get along with everybody. You, you know that. Everyone will not like you. Anybody who th- anybody still think that it's, it's about all kinds of things. If you stand for something, there will be those who oppose that. So if you're wise, you choose the right enemies. You say, well, I don't want to have enemies. Hmm? James the Apostle said that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God. So which team do you want to support? Parramatta, Souths, Manly, you know, who are you for? Also tells who you're against. Mm -hmm. And if you're for God, you're against those who oppose God. And if you don't think like that, then you're going to be ever battling yourself. Because what is it? It's an adoration of self. It's an idolatrous relationship that you have with you if you want everyone to be on side with you. Um, Let me give you just these. Galatians 1 is probably the most piercing one. Um, Galatians 1 verse 10. For am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Mm -hmm. Or am I striving to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Messiah. 1 Thessalonians 2 4 says, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who examines our heart. There really is a conflict between man-pleasing and God-pleasing. Now, that doesn't mean that you should offend everyone. I'm sorry, I'm pleasing God, and I hate you, and you hate me, and, and I, thrive, I thrive on your hostility to me. So it's all part of choosing who you're going to serve and who you want to please. If you want to please men, you can please men. There will be plenty of people who will adore you, and that's your idolatry. Because if you please men for your sake, what are you getting? You're getting praise. You're getting glory to you, which is idolatry. And if you are trying to please God, then that'll come at a cost to you. And that cost to you is that people will say, who do you think you are? Will, you some kind of uh, Holy Joe or something? What are you, some kind of smokescreen pastor or something you're trying to show off your religion? Quit shoving your religion down my throat. How many times you hear that? Like, I've never put anything down your throat. It's just the weirdest phrase. Have I communicated something in your ears? Why is that shoving down your throat? You know, I mean, anatomically, it's a weird, weird thing to say. But this whole idea of of pleasing people versus pleasing God is one with which we are constantly battling, and it's especially in Australia. Back to Judges. Abimelech and all the people who were with him arose. Gal, the son of Ebed, went out, stood in the entrance of the city gate. Abimelech and the people who were with him arose from the ambush. And Gal saw the people. He said to Zebul, that's his lieutenant, look, people are coming down from the tops of the mountains. Zebul said, you're seeing the shadow of the mountains as if they were men. Gal spoke again, no, behold, people are coming down from the highest part. And one company comes by way of the diviner's oak. So Zebul said, where's your boasting now with which you said, Psh, who's Abimelech that we should serve him? Is this not the people whom you despise? You go out now and fight with them. 
So Gal went out before the leaders and he fought with Abimelech and Abimelech chased him. And he, that's Gal, fled before him, that's Abimelech. And many fell wounded to the entrance of the gate. Abimelech remained at Aruma, but Zebul drove out Gaal and his relatives so that they could not remain in Shechem. So he lost the battle. Came about the next day, people went out to the field, it was told to Abimelech, so he, he took the people, divided them into three different companies, lay in wait in the field. <laughs> he looked, he saw the people coming out from the city, arose against them and slew them, and Abimelech and the company who was with him dashed forward, stood in the entrance of the city, the other two companies then dashed against all who were in the field and slew them all. Abimelech fought against the city all that day, captured the city, killed the people who were in it, raised, that means lowered, <laughs> sorry, raised the city and sowed it with salt. Raised means destroyed, leveled, dropped, fell, and sowed it with salt. Salt was used for money in those days. Salt, that is expensive in some cases, but not in this case. When you sow it with salt, what are you doing? It's an edaphic ruin, and as a result, nothing could grow there. He destroyed it. When all the leaders of the town of Shechem heard of it, they entered the inner chamber of the temple of El Berith. It was told Abimelech that all the leaders of the town were gathered together. So Abimelech went out. He's thinking, this is good. I can wipe him out. Went out to Mount Zalman. He and all the people who were with him. Abimelech took an axe in his hand, cut down a branch from the trees, lifted it, laid it on his shoulder, said to the people, what you've seen me do, hurry, you go do too. So everybody goes and takes a tree, wax it. And uh, so all the people also cut down each one. His branch followed Abimelech, put them on the inner chamber, set the inner chamber on fire over those inside so that all the men of the tower of Shechem also died. A thousand men and women. This is the king of Shechem. This is the son of Gideon. Are you embarrassed? I mean, he's horrible. He's a horrible representative of Gideon's legacy. Verse 50, Abimelech went to Tebez. It's about 10 kilometers away. Camped against Tebez, captured it. There was a strong tower in the center of the city and all the men and women with the leaders of the city fled there and shut themselves. And they went up on the roof of the tower. And Abimelech came to the tower, <laughs> thinking, I can do the same with them that I just did to the Shechemites. He approached the entrance of the tower to burn it with fire. This is going to be good. Everybody grab. So basically, he did the same thing. Chopped down a branch, put it on his shoulder, said, everybody come do it again. Because once you get a success, the danger in military battles, the danger in life is that everything will go flow the same way. Mm. Love this. Verse 53. But a certain woman mm. threw an upper millstone on Abimelech's head, mm. crushing his skull. So this woman drops an upper millstone on Abimelech's head, crushing his skull. He called quickly to the young man, draw your sword and kill me so that it will not be said of me a woman slew him. So the young man pierced him through and he died. When the men of Israel saw that Abimelech was dead, everybody went home. Like, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Game's over. You know, we lost 47 to 12. Thus God repaid the wickedness of Abimelech, which he had done to his father in killing his 70 brothers. What a lesson that is. What you do to families, you do to the whole family. What you do to any member. When Yeshua said, what you've done to the least of these, my brothers, you've done to me. There's a there's an historical precedent for that. And God returned all the <laughs> wickedness of the men of Shechem on their heads. And the curse of Jotham, the son of Jerubbaal, came upon them. Mm. Three years and change later, Jotham predicted that fire would come out of both, mm. and they'd kill each other, and that's just what happened. And it's a horrible ending. Look at the, the outline, if you will. Sorry. We've got the seizing of the kingdom, which Abimelech did almost without without pain, just a political maneuvering, and he captured, you know, 61% of the vote or whatever it was. I mean, he, he dominated, but his pride ended up killing him. I can do this. I don't need God. I mean, pride comes before a fall, and pride is the killer. It's certainly the beginning of all his sin. He secured the kingdom. Got all boasted, and then he was defeated. I mean, I, Everybody and their brother dies in this story except <laughs> Jotham. He's the only good guy left. And the kingdom is lost in the last section. Uh, let's read some of these verses. Second Samuel 11, 21. Read Psalm 34, 21. Proverbs 21, 12. All three have a 21 in it. I don't know that that means anything. So what does the record of scripture say about the death of Abimelech? A woman did it. Just some chick. Which is totally against a warrior's life, right? You want to die in battle. What did he die from? A millstone dropped over his head. 
So he didn't even die fighting. He died by a woman. So he, he had two scars on his uh, on his tombstone, if you will. The record of scripture is clear. Yeah, it was a woman by a millstone. It was a rock. Just think of a rock. Psalm 34. Whether in this life or the next, the, those who hate the righteous are going to lose. So if you... I mean, this goes to the whole idea of men pleasing. You want to be on the righteous team, not on the evil team. Because if you're on the evil team, you will hate the righteous. And that ends up being the very thing you don't want to be and do. And it doesn't necessarily mean that evil will hate the righteous and we're going to win tomorrow. It might be a year from now. It might be 20 years from now. We don't know. Proverbs 21, verse 12. You know, at the end of the day, we're going to either be righteous or we're going to be wicked. Gosh, that's simple. Mm. Is that too simple? Is that painfully simple? Is that embarrassing? What defines wickedness and what defines righteousness? How do you get righteous? What does that mean? What does it look like? You read that verse and you say, okay, I want to be on the guy's team with the letter R on my on the front. What does that look like? Good. Well, that's a, a redefinition. So if you're right with God, righteous is right with God. Yeah, okay, what else? How do you get righteous? How do you get right with God? Say it again. So you speak truth, you live truth, you act truthfully, so faithful to follow Yeshua, okay? And therefore, if it's up to what Jesus already did, we gotta, we've got to believe it, it and live it and, and follow it and, and act on it. These, these are, you know, you, you, talk, you go out and do a survey out on George Street and say, excuse me, how, have you heard of righteousness or rightness with God? You know, whatever term. You finally get somebody on side with you and say, yeah, yeah, I've heard of that. How would you become right with God? What do you reckon 9 out of 10 people will say? It's something you do. They'd say, keep the law. That's over in Bondi. We're not on George Street. Yeah, but they'd say, but they'd say, uh, uh, yeah, keep the Ten Commandments. And you'd say, great, like, like which ones? And, and probably 75% of the people on George Street couldn't name two of the Ten Commandments. Can't name two, but you're responsible to keep all ten. Right, so what else would they say? Uh, how do you get right with God? What else would they say? Stop doing bad things. I guess I should stop. What else is the? They'd say go to church or synagogue or, you know, be more religious. I guess I should diet. They'll they'll throw in their New Year's resolution of food and foodlessness. Uh, that'd be an interesting dynamic, something you can do over the next week. And be more devoted to my reading schedule. Be more habitual in prayer. I should pray more. Yeah, I, I'm going to guess maybe 1% of people would mention religious reading. Most would say, do good works. Um, give more to the church, give more to charity. They would say, um, practice my religion more. It's all about what they do. But you've well said that righteousness, according to the scripture, is based on what God did in his son Yeshua. Right, righteousness, getting right with God, is based on what God has done. It's based on what God did. Based. How do you enter into that? You pray, you say thanks, you, you, you say, I appreciate that, I receive it. But the prayer itself, Itself is a function of faith. Faith is a function of seeing God who's done all these wonderful things. Nothing you do makes you righteous. Nothing you have ever done made you righteous. Nothing you ever will do will make you righteous. Isn't that hard to hear? Mm. It's hard to hear because doggone it, I'm trying. I'm trying to be religious. I'm trying to love God. I'm trying to show God how cool I am, how righteous I am. I'm trying to seize the kingdom. Oh wait, no, that's wrong. No, I don't want that part because that's going to end in loss. They need to take it by faith, the force of faith, and not the force of a sword. Look at the history of the church in the last two millennia, taking the kingdom in the Crusades or the Inquisition or any number of slaughters of people across any nation where conquistadors went and converted people at the edge of a sword. That's not the kingdom of God, which is, what does it say? Romans 14, 17. The kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. That's the kingdom of God. Righteousness, peace, and joy. Just think about those in order. If you get right with God, you have peace. And if you don't get right with God, you will never have peace. And if you have peace with God, then joy is a natural result. I love the order of things in Bible. Righteousness, peace, and joy. Where does it come from? In the Holy Spirit. In our, in our relation to God himself. So if you get those right, you are right. Righteousness with God. And it is the Galatian heresy. The Galatian error, we'll just say, 
today, so I'm not so harsh. The Galatian error that we can earn the next points. God, thanks for giving me the t-shirt so that I can be on the right team. Thanks for helping me be born again to a living hope. Thanks. I, now I got it. If you receive Jesus as Savior and Lord, that you become right with God. Yeah, uh, that's what I said. Yeah, you, yep, bad guys like you, bad guys like me, can be forgiven. That's pretty awesome. That's pretty awesome when you think about it. No, you cannot repair your life enough to get ready for the God who wants to repair your life. God is up there almost like a celestial Olympic judge and you've got to perform to make the God give you a 10.0 or maybe a 9.7 and he'll work on the rest. The religion about which we're speaking is this. You will never make a 10.0. You can try all day long and that's, that's wonderful in religion or in philosophy or in science or in any number of things. But at the end of the day, the way to being right with God is to fall on his grace and call on his mercy. Mercy meaning not getting what you deserve. Grace meaning getting what you don't deserve. And when you note that in your life, you'll say, Lord, I'm counting on the one who got it. <coughs> who got a 10.0 in his Olympic standards, and that was Yeshua. No other religion says that. All other religions say it's on you. And so the Galatian error is what? It says, God gave me forgiveness. I'm right with God. Now I've got it the rest of the way. I'll take care, I'll do mitzvahs, I'll be honorable, I'll keep kosher, I'll keep Shabbos, I'll be very, very religious, and then God will continue to like me. He's not impressed. There are good things that God extends to people. Um, so this is, this is a, a fascinating ending of Judges chapter nine. What lesson do I want you to get? Be humble, be righteous, choose the right team, choose the right opponents, and somehow grieve for our brother Gideon, whose legacy was marred in this way, but whose personal legacy continues in Hebrews chapter 11 in the Hall of Faith. There he is, he's still there as a man of faith, even though failure followed his, his family. Uh, Lord, thanks for this splash of a lesson and help us to live righteously. Help us to trust you that much more tonight and tomorrow. And I pray for my brothers and sisters as we celebrate Messiahmas on Saturday, Sunday and Monday, um, that you will give them a great time in fellowship with you in Yeshua's name. Thank you.